So for the example today, we're going to go over how you load shapefiles into R and how you work with them using ggplot and using the SF package. Um, this should be a, a briefer version of what is going to be online. Um, if you go to the course website to the examples page for today, that's a fully worked out um, code through where there's lots and lots of comments. Um, mostly this is going to be much, going to be much shorter and the whole purpose is to show you how you navigate within our studio to see this magical geometry column and how you can sort by it and how you can do some, some fancy data things with it. Um, but the bulk of this example is going to be on the website, not in this video. Um, but you'll still get value out of this video if you want to watch it. So, um, let's go ahead and switch over to our studio and so here in our studio, um, I have an empty R Markdown file already with kind of the main things I'm going to show in this video. Um, I've already created a new project um, that is pointed at my desktop. Um, if you look in the console here, it's pointed at desktop. Um, there's a folder called space that I put there. So the working directory is already all set because this is a um, this is a R Studio project, and so we should be ready to go. Um, Right now, all I have in there is this R Markdown file. I need to get some data in there. And if you look at the website um, for the example, I have a zip file there of a whole bunch of different shape files that you can download. So if you look right here and you click on this, um, to save you the time of going through and finding every single one of these um, shape files on the internet, um, and downloading them and unzipping them. You can just do it all in one. Um, the full list of where all these shapefiles come from is on the course website under, um, under this section here. And so you can kind of do it on your own if you want as well. Um, but to make life simple, we're just gonna download that zip file. It's here in my downloads folder. So I can unzip it. On a Mac, if I just click on the zip file, it will automatically unzip it and put it in my downloads folder. Um, if you're on Windows, you need to right click on it and say extract all and then choose where you want to extract it. And so if you look here um, in the unzipped shapefiles folder, um, there's a whole bunch of subfolders within each or within that, that zip file. And each of these subfolders connect or contains a whole bunch of different files in it. There's a shape file, that's the main thing we care about that has all of the geographic information, but it also has um, projection information and a whole bunch of other metadata that goes along with each of the um, shape files. So technically you, you need lots of these files. You don't need them all. Like some of them will have a readme file that you technically don't need. Um, you could throw that away. You can throw away this version information. All this says is 4.1.0. So neat. Um, but it's just general good practice to just keep everything in a folder right there and live with it like that. So next we need to put all of these shape files into our project folder. So I'm going to come to my desktop. Um, because I have a folder there called space. And I want to create a new folder here called data. That's where I'm going to put all of the data. If this were a real project, I would put whatever CSV files or Excel files or whatever I'm working with in here, um, in addition to all of these shape files. So I'm going to grab these and move them into my data folder. So now I have data. Um, and then I have all of these shape file folders here with the actual shape files inside each one of them. And so we should be good to go now. So if we come back to our space example, our markdown file, we're going to get started by loading tidyverse and then loading the SF library. Um, the SF library is the main workhorse behind all of this um, shapefile stuff. It's what actually processes the shapefiles and reads them and does all of the uh, geometric and geographic calculations. Um, it's a super powerful package. It's great for all of this plotting stuff we're going to do. And so we're going to insert a new chunk and say library tidyverse right here. And then we're going to say library SF so that we get that SF library going. So if we click on play here, it should load tidyverse and it should load SF. Um, again, it has all of these helpful inf helpful messages and warnings, but we can actually just turn those off so that when we knit, we don't see them. So warning equals false and message equals false. So now when we load this, we should see nothing. Great. Okay, so we're going to add a new chunk here. Um, just to be good coders, we're going to name it called load data. And just to simplify life, we're going to paste all of the code directly from the website in here um, because there's a lot of just typing here. This is just all of the shape files that we put in that downloads folder. Um, we are going to just load them into R here. 
So the syntax for doing that is you use this read underscore sf function and that reads the shape file. This doesn't stand for shape file. Um, SF stands for simple features, which is a standard um, geography term for this geographic data. So it's not like you might think that that's shape file, it's not. Um, and so then we give it a path to that shape file. So this first one is going to pick up um, all of the countries from around the world. This is from the Natural Earth Project. Um, the link for that is on the website. Um, they have tons of shape, shape files for every country in the world. Um, they're fantastic. Um, so that shape file lives in data slash natural earth 110 meters admin countries and then the shape file inside. So if we run this, we should get a data set called world map over here. I'm going to go ahead and run this whole chunk so that we get all of the data sets in here. And it should load everything. We've got a bunch of stuff. So if we look at this environment panel, all of these look like regular data sets. Um, they have rows, they have columns. Um, so let's look at this world map here. So this very first shape file that we loaded. If you look at it, it looks just like a normal data set that you've been working with in R. You have columns, um, and so you can see like the sovereignty column shows the name of the country. Um, you have the ISO3 code for each of the countries. Um, you have different levels. If you look at the documentation for the natural earth data, it'll tell you what all these things are. Um, generally, you can kind of guess what they are, um, like names and abbreviations and postal codes and formal names and a whole bunch of stuff. So as you keep scrolling through, you see all these things. They include population. That's neat. Um, they have the year when the population was taken. They have GDP uh, estimates. They've got all sorts of cool information in here. Um, this data set has 95 columns in it. In our studio, it only shows you 50 at a time. So if you look up in this top corner here, um, if you click on this arrow here, it will get you to the next page of columns. And so now we're on page two of all of the columns, still just lots of information here. Um, if you want to plot the names in Arabic or the names in um, German or whatever, they've got a ton of different languages here. If you scroll all the way to the end, the magical thing about this data set, and the thing that makes it different from a normal um, CSV file that you would load, is this final column here called geometry. This is where all of the coordinates that get plotted onto a map live. Um, so if you look here, this is just like a list of a list um, of a whole bunch of coordinates. And so there's like 180, 179.9. So this looks like it's on the 180, negative 180 to 180 scale that we have with latitude and longitude on maps. Um, and really, this is just a giant list of coordinates that um, in here, it just says that this is the boundary for this country. And you can plot the boundary of the country using all these coordinates. Um, sometimes it's easy, like Fiji is a small island, and so if you hover over this, it should show the list that's not excessively big. But some countries, if it's like Canada or something, it's going to have like massive borders and all of the tiny islands up in the north. And so these geometry column or these geometry cells are going to get gigantic. Um, but you don't really need to worry about that. You just need to know that the geometry column exists, and that's what um, that's where all of the magic from the SF package comes from is from um, that column. So to plot a shapefile, it's actually like incredibly easy. Um, we're going to add a new chunk here. Um, the easiest way to do it is we're just going to use ggplot. Instead of setting a data set here and then the aesthetics um, in the global layer, we're going to do it in individual layers. And this is important because often you'll have lots of shapefiles and you want to layer them on top of each other. And so you want each of the layers that you're adding to have its own data set. And if you specify a data set in the global ggplot uh, function, then you're going to have to override that over and over again, and that's going to get tedious. So the easiest thing is just to leave it completely blank and just say ggplot, open parentheses, close parentheses. And then we're going to say geom underscore sf. The data we want it to plot, we have to say data, so it knows that this is the data set we're looking at, is going to be world map. And if we run that, we should get a map. That's all we have to do. And there's our map. That is like magic. Um, it just knows that all of, the, all of the coordinates in that geometry column are geographic points. It figures out where they're supposed to go on the map. Um, it handles um, coordinate or the projection transformation for you magically. Um, at the same time, this world map data set is still just like a data set. 
And so all of our dplyr verbs work on this. If we want to mutate and add a new column, if we want to group by and summarize, we can do that. Um, if we want to filter, we can do that. Um, so we're going to really quickly filter so that we get rid of Antarctica, Antarctica because that's taking up like a ton of the map and we don't really need to show it here. So what we can do is make a smaller data set here called map minus Antarctica. And this is going to be based on our world map data set. But we're going to add a pipe and we're going to say filter so that um, we don't look at Antarctica. And the easy way to do this is you look at the world map data set and you find Antarctica and figure out a way to omit it. So if we look here and search for Antarctica, there it is. Um, we could either say sovereignty is not equal to Antarctica or we can use the ISO, the ISO code, um, ATA3. Um, over here there's an ISO3 or ISO A3 and that's ATA and that's I generally work with ISO codes when I'm working with countries. So we can say filter ISO A3 is not equal to ATA. So if we do that, it should get rid of Antarctica. And then we want to plot this new data set, not the whole world map. And if we run it now, we should get a map with no Antarctica. Great. Um, so it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds. We can do regular dplyr stuff to the data sets, but then because it has that magical geometry column, anytime we include geomsf, it will figure out the best way to plot that. Um, if it's a whole bunch of points in the geometry column, it will put points. If, it's, if it sees that it's a whole bunch of borders, it will do borders. If it sees that it's a bunch of paths, like freeways or roads, it will draw those as lines and not as other things. Um, like areas or anything. And so that's like fantastic. Um, it also works with all of the normal aesthetic things that we've been working with. We can, we can fill, we can color, we can change the sizes of all of these shapes here. So for instance, we can fill and say, make all of the countries blue. So if we plot that, we should get kind of a really ugly blue map, neat. Um, we can color it, that will be the line, the borders. So we can say color equals white. Now this should look even grosser. That's better, sure. Um, we can change the thickness of the borders. We can say size equals like 0.25. So they're gonna be super thin borders. That actually looks okay. Um, if we wanna go like super wild, we can say size equals five. And now the borders are gonna be gigantic like that. That's awful. Let's not do that. So 0 0.25. Um, you can also do themes. Often the easiest thing to do with maps is if you don't care about like the actual geographic coordinates underneath and the and the guidelines, um, you can just use theme void, which basically eliminates all theme elements completely. And then if you want to add other things later, like a title or a subtitle, then you can add those in a theme function after to change those. Um, but basically you start with theme void and add what you need instead of starting with something like theme black and white and theme gray and then taking off each of the elements like the background and the lines and everything else. Um, so if we do a theme void, we should get a nice standalone map like that of the entire world um, with like four lines of code. That's amazing. Um, so that's, that's how you make maps. Um, what I'm going to do now is we'll come to the next section with projections. So in the lecture, we talked about different ways of projecting a round globe onto a flat piece of paper. And there are a whole bunch of different systems for doing that. Um, you can get a PhD in geography and math and figure out the new latest best way to do it. Um, so there's no right way to do it. You just have to play around with it and see what communicates what you're trying to say the best and the most truthfully. Um, to change the projection with a map in ggplot using this SF uh, uh, package, all you need to do is add one more layer called chord underscore SF. And here you can give it an argument called CRS, and you can either give it a numeric code or you can give it a string um, of text that specifies what the projection is. So if you look at the example website, um, 
at the very top, I actually have a list of a whole bunch of different codes. There are a whole bunch of different websites like the spatialreference.org or the epsg.io that have just a list of all of the different projection systems that people use. Um, they have standardized numbers. And so regardless of what program you're using, if you're going to use like ArcGIS or um, Python or whatever, anything that does anything with geographic data, these numbers are the same in all of these different places. So if we want the Mercator projection, for instance, um, even though it's an awful projection, um, that number is 54004. So if we come back to our studio and say CRS equals 54004, we should get a map that uses the Mercator projection. And so now Greenland is bigger than um, Africa, and that's the main issue with Mercator here. Um, but we did it. We just had to type in the right code. If we want it to use a Robinson projection, that is 5403030. And if we run that now, this is the nice Robinson projection, which tries to keep equal proportions all around. And so now Greenland is not as big as Africa. Europe is much smaller than Africa. It's kind of a more accurate version of this map. Um, you're not limited to just those. Um, you can also do something like the sinusoidal a projection which is 54008 and this looks fun um, this fisheye view I don't know when you would want to use that but you can it looks neat um, there's just a ton of different ones that all exist online and so really you just um, Google CRS code whatever the name of the projection is and you'll either find this numeric code or you can use this text here so if we want this mall wide or the, we'll do the Cassini Saldner. Um, if we copy this and instead of using the number, we use that text, it should do the Cassini Saldner projection, which is that. That's neat. Um, no idea why you'd use that. I'm not a geographer, but it exists. Neat. Okay, so that's how you use projections. The really cool thing about projections and why this SF package is so powerful is that um, if you're doing multiple layers here, um, each of these shape files that you load has a coordinate reference system embedded in it, um, which you can actually see. So if we run this, uh, so if we want to see what the what the coordinate reference system is for this uh, world map thing is, we can see s we can do st underscore crs, and then feed the name of the data here. And so it tells us that it is currently using this 4326 system, which is what the, the GPS system uses worldwide. This is the thing that Google Maps uses. Um, this is the standard negative 180 to 180 system. And so even though this one data set is using 4326, if we layer a different data set on, you can do multiple GM SF layers. If one of the other data sets is a completely different CRS, um, and then we add another one that's a completely different one. As long as we add this chord SF, it will force all of the other um, GEOM SF layers to follow the same CRS. And it will transform them and do all of the, the, the transformations behind the scenes automatically for you. You don't need to worry about making, one of the data, making all the data sets be the same coordinate reference system. It just does it um, because of chord SF, which is like magic. So... That's a good thing about this whole SF system that things like Geom Polygon or Geom Map that um, used to be the ways of doing um, this, this GIS stuff in R, it didn't automatically transform all of the different layers to the same coordinate reference system for you. Um, this does. So that's like awesome. Um, so now let's add some multiple layers here um, because we want to do often like we have a nice world map here, but we might want to put other points on here. We might want to um, fill by different things. We might want to show county subdivisions. We might want to do other things other than just like a world map. Um, so to, do, to show this, we're going to use, instead of the world map, we're going to use this US states data. Um, this is, comes from the Census Bureau, this shape file. It has 52 observations in it um, for all these different states here, plus um, Puerto Rico and DC, which is why there's 52. Um, it has, it doesn't have as much detail as the world map um, data set, just because they didn't include that. Um, we have different state codes, we have state abbreviations, we have state names, 
Um, we have the area of land and area of water if we were interested in using those. Um, but then we have our geometry column that has all of the borders for each of the states. So that is what will get mapped. So if we come here, we can just go ahead and map that super quick. So we say ggplot, open parentheses, close parentheses. We're going to say geom underscore sf. The data layer that we want to plot is US states. And if we just run that by itself, we should get a state map like that. Okay, one issue with this is Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico um, and part of the Aleutian Islands are all mapped on here. Um, and then the rest of the lower 48 states are kind of all by themselves. And so that's not the greatest map because we're missing the rest of the world, first of all, and we can't really zoom in just on the United States, on the 48 states of the United States. So what we can do, because this is a data set, we can just filter it and we can remove the states that we don't want to plot. So we're going to, um, at the beginning here, make a new data set called just lower 48. This is going to be based on US states, but we're going to filter and we're going to say, um, what's the name of the column here? If we look at US states, the name is name, all caps. So we're going to come here and we're going to say name in and then give it a list of states that we don't want to include. So Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico, but in quotes. If I run this now, it will actually only keep those three states. Um, it will filter and only keep states where that's the name. So I actually want to negate this whole thing. I want to say f keep rows where the name is not in this list. And the easiest way to do that is to put this whole name in list of states in parentheses and then put a uh, exclamation point at the beginning. So this is saying filter so that it's not having the name be one of these states. So now if we run it, we should only get 49 states. Um, DC is the other one that's in there. And so now rather than plot US states, we're gonna plot lower 48 and we should have the lower 48 states. Great. Um, right now, this is using that built-in projection system that's kind of based on the GPS coordinates. Um, and so you can tell, like if you look at the northern border of the United States, that's completely straight because it's following that latitude line all the way across. Um, we can use that same projection idea and change the projection. One common projection for the United States is the Albers projection, um, which I looked up. The number is zero or one zero two zero zero three. So if we do this, it will still do a map of the United States, but it will be curvy in the northern border, like that, um, which looks great. And so that's cool. That's great for kind of the whole United States here. If you were zooming in on just one state, like if we were just plotting Nevada, we probably wouldn't want to use this Albers projection because then our map of Nevada would be twisted funny. Um, or especially like Washington, that's like way twisted funny. And so we're not going to want to use the Albers projection for the entire United States. Um, but if you go to the um, spatialreference.org website and you search for like Oregon or Washington, it will give you um, a list of coordinate reference systems that are appropriate for that state. Um, that have been, have been designed for that specific state. And so like we can search for Georgia, there's actually an Albers projection that was made for Georgia. And so it'll still project Georgia correctly, but using Albers, but not like twist it funny. Um, and so it's kind of a, a better way of, of mapping states. Um, so how do we get that though? Because right now we're just trying to show multiple layers with states and counties. So right now we have states, but we want to extract just one of these states. We just want to plot Georgia, and then we want to put the counties on top of the, our, our plot of Georgia. So what we can do is we'll make another data set here based on US states. So we'll come down here and make a new chunk. And we're going to call this only Georgia. And this is going to be based on US states. But here we're going to filter so that name is equal to Georgia. So if we run that and we look over it in our environment, we should have a data set that only has one row that has um, this is the row for Georgia. It still has our geometry column in there. So there's the Georgia boundaries. 
Um, so now we can plot just Georgia. If we come here and say ggplot, open parentheses, close parentheses, we want geom underscore sf, and then data equals only Georgia. If we plot that, we should get just Georgia. Beautiful. Um, but now we want to put the county boundaries on there instead of just having the state boundaries. And so one of the data sets we loaded up at the very top um, was this called U.S. Counties, which came from the Census Bureau. And it has all of the boundaries for every county in the United States. So if we look over in the side here, we can see that it has 3,233 rows. Um, if we scroll through, we see it has a whole bunch of identification columns. Um, it has the names of the counties, it has the area of the land, area of the water if we're interested. And then there's our geometry column telling us what all the boundaries are for each of the, each of the counties. Um, so what we want to do is filter this U.S. counties data so that it only shows Georgia counties. Um, the problem, though, is none of these columns here actually say Georgia in them. They're all just uh, numeric codes or the actual names of counties. So what we have to do is figure out how we can find Georgia. And the hint for this is this column right here, the state FP. The United States has a system called uh, the FIPS codes, which stands for like Federal Information Processing something. Um, it's just a standardized coding system for all counties and um, states in the United States. And so Georgia is number 13. I happen to know that because I've worked with Georgia FIPS codes before. We can actually verify that if we look at only Georgia here. Um, and we say the state FP code for Georgia is 13. And so the FIPS code for Georgia is 13. So what, what we can do to get just Georgia counties is filter this so that we only look where state FIPS code is 13. So if we come back here and scroll down to where we were, um, we're going to grab the Georgia counties. So this is going to be based on US counties, but we're going to filter where, I forgot the name of the column, it is state FP in all caps. So state FP equals 13. So if we run that now, we should have 159 rows over here for all of the counties in Georgia. And there they are. We have Forsyth County and Lanier County and um, Gwinnett is in here somewhere and Fulton is in here somewhere. Everybody's in here. Um, so now we have all of the counties and we still have that geometry column that's been sticking around as we've been doing this. So now what we can do is we can add another SF layer to our plot. So originally we were just showing the boundaries of Georgia. Now we're going to add another geom SF layer and we're going to say data equals GA underscore counties. And if we run that, we should get the map of Georgia. So on the, on the outline here, we have just the Georgia map. And then we have all of the counties inside, um, which is really cool. Uh, technically, if we took off the state map and just did the county map, we would still get the shape of Georgia. That's because each of the counties that are on the border of the state, um, that's also part of the county borders. And so it, it naturally makes that, um, that kind of shape there. Um, but where it's helpful to layer these things is one, if we want to have like a thick border around the state, we can add that to this only Georgia layer. So we can say size equals like five. And so now we should have a thick border just around the edge of the state. Um, had we said a size equals five for the counties, then each of these counties would have a really thick border, and we don't want that. That's probably an excessively big border, but it still shows what you can do. Um, it's also helpful if you don't want to show all of the counties. Um, if we just want to show the counties that are in the Atlanta metropolitan area, we'll make a new data set called Atlanta counties. And this is going to be based on Georgia counties. But here we're going to filter so that we only look at 10 counties that are in the Atlanta metropolitan area. And I have that code over here, separate screen, because I don't want to type that all. Um, because I looked on Google what the main counties for Atlanta were, and they were these 10, Cherokee, Clayton, Cobb, etc. So here we're going to filter our Georgia counties data set and only choose the rows where the name is one of these 10 things. So if we run that now, we can see that we have 10 rows of Atlanta counties. So we're going to still plot only Georgia. We'll take off this ugly size thing. Um, but then we're going to, instead of plotting Georgia counties, we'll just plot Atlanta counties. 
So if we plot it now, we should get a big empty shape for the state. And then there is the Atlanta metropolitan area with all 10 of its counties there which is really cool. So we've taken a state layer and we've put on an additional county layer um, right on top of it, which is really neat. Um, on the website, I show another really neat example of another way you can do this using all sorts of other data. So the US Geological Survey publishes um, shape files on all sorts of national parks and national forests and where all the rivers are and where all the mountains are. And you can download all sorts of shape files the Natural Earth website has a list of tons of global rivers and North American rivers and lakes and streams. And so what I do on the website, I'm not going to do it here because um, I have it all documented here, is you can basically make a map like this. This is the state shape of Georgia with a lakes layer added to it, with a big rivers layer added to it, and with a small layers river or small rivers layer added to it. So this is like four different layers all working at the same time. You can see that here, this Geom SF, it's we have four different layers on there with lakes, rivers, rivers, and the state boundaries. Um, and then we force it to use this specific um, coordinate system, this NAD83, which is kind of a standard North American um, system. And so there's this really cool artsy map of Georgia with all of the rivers. Um, and you can do this like fairly easily. You just follow the code that I have here and you can see the process of doing that. But we're not going to do it in the video. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is map some actual points. So far, all we've been doing is mapping shapes. We have shape or we have state boundaries, we have county boundaries, but we want to put like dots on here. Um, and then we can color and fill those dots by different values and we can visualize like the proportion of schools or the distribution of schools in the state of Georgia. Um, the way we're going to do this is I included a, a shape file called um, Georgia Schools. I found this at the Georgia has this um, Georgia Spatial Portal. Um, you have to create a free account. It's kind of a clunky system with an awful search system and it logs you out like every 10 minutes and it's miserable. Um, if you create an account and then log in and then go to this URL, you will find this shape file that has um, basically the positions of all Georgia school K through 12 schools in 2009. So it's kind of like 11 years out of date, but it's, it's still useful. We can plot it. Um, so we're going to work with this Georgia schools data. So just to see what's in there, if we click on the Georgia Schools data set over in the environment panel, we can see um, that every school has an ID number, it has some data column. If we looked at the documentation for the data, we would know exactly what that means. Um, we can see the county that it's in, the school district it's in, the school name, what grades are included. So this is pre-K through five, this is six through 12, this is just a middle school, this is just a high school. Um, so you can you can do some data manipulation here and like try to identify only elementary schools, only middle schools, only high schools. That's going to be a little bit tricky because some, sometimes you have um, schools like this that are middle through um, through high school, and so it, they're all over the map here. We have the address of the school, the city, state, zip code. This total column I'm assuming is the number of students. Um, it makes sense because if we sort it, there's one school in somewhere in Georgia the Effingham County Gateway to College Academy with one student in it. Neat. Um, if we sort the other way, we'll see that there are a bunch of schools with almost 4,000, 3,700, 3,400, 3,200. And all of those schools are in Gwinnett County, which is where I live. And this is very, very true. All of the schools here are insanely big. Um, with thousands of people, even like the elementary school that my kids go to has like 800 or 900 students in it, which is like nuts. Um, and we can see that here in the data, like Gwinnett, for whatever reason, has massive schools. Um, and then it's got other information here, like the congressional district that it's in, the Senate district, the House district, a whole bunch of other stuff. And our magic geometry column, which is what lets us plot things. Notice how this is slightly different instead of being a giant list of coordinates that we saw before that was making boundaries, this is actually two coordinates, um, this first one and the second one. It is not the standard negative 180 to 180 system. That's because this is a different um, coordinate reference system that's getting used in the Georgia Schools data set. So if we wanted to, we could use the st underscore crs function and see what actual um, CRS this is using, 
but we actually don't really need to worry about that because as soon as we plot this, it will convert it to whatever CRS we want. And so this might be like NAD83 or something, um, which is fine. We'll just switch it to whatever we need once we start plotting it. So it's fine that it's a different system. So to get started, a good idea before you start adding layers is to just plot the data set and see what it looks like. So we're going to do the same thing, empty ggplot, geom underscore sf, data equals ga schools, and we will plot it. And there's our map, and that is terrifying. So this is neat because this happens in real life all the time. Um, this is like real world messy data that is broken. So here's Georgia with all of the points there. And here's some random point at zero degrees and zero degrees that's getting mapped. Um, whoever put this data up on the internet, I'm guessing they have one school wrong. That's probably like in Australia or New Zealand or Indonesia, somewhere in the South Pacific-ish area. Um, there's no way that's a Georgia school. There's something wrong. Um, so we need to find out what it is. So if we come to the Georgia schools data, um, one way we can do it, if you look at the geometry column, most of these schools with their x and y coordinates should be fairly close together. Um, we have some that start with 23. I think this is, um, like these are big numbers, but they're all kind of in the 23s, 21s, 30s. Those seem all close together. We can sort by the geometry column. Um, and so we can see what points, like the lowest number it goes with this X and Y coordinates is we have 180, or this is like 1.8 million. Um, if we sort the other way, there is a weird point. I think that is our issue. Um, because we're going, like we're in the, th uh, the three millions here with this numbering system. And then suddenly we're up into like the five millions and then we're in a negative number for the Y and all the other Y's here are positive and in like the 700,000 ish range. So whatever point this is, I'm guessing that's our weird Australia, Indonesia point. Um, another hint why this might be wrong is that it's missing data for these other columns here. It doesn't have a congressional seat. It doesn't have a Senate seat or a House seat. So I'm guessing this row is just messed up. Um, if we scroll over, we can see it's Alatoona High School in Cobb County, which is here in Atlanta. Um, but it's whoever coded this coded it wrong. So what we want to do is just get rid of that row because it's messy. If we were super official, we could go find, like go on Google Maps, find the actual coordinates and replace them um, with the real coordinates, but we're not gonna worry about that. We'll just get rid of it. Um, the ID for this school should be unique. It's this 22097. So we'll just copy that. And if we come back to here, we're going to say GA schools underscore fixed. And it's gonna be based on GA schools, but we're going to say filter um, I can't remember what the ID, capital ID. So ID is not equal to that strange school that is coded wrong. So now, rather than plotting GA schools, we're going to plot GA schools fixed. And we should get a map of just Georgia now. Yes. So it's just a whole bunch of points because we only told it to plot one layer. Um, if we want the state layer underneath or the county layer underneath, we have to add those. We can actually grab those from up here. Um, let's grab these two layers and come down here. The ordering of these layers matters. Um, if we put the schools first and then put the state boundary, it's going to put the state boundary on top of the schools and we're not going to see any of the points. And so we want to put the state boundary on first and then the county boundaries on top of that and then the dots on top of that. And rather than plotting Atlanta counties, we're going to plot all the Georgia counties so now, if we plot this, we should have three different layers, one for state, one for counties, one for schools. And there are all the schools in Georgia in 2009. Um, we have some issues. That's a lot of overplotting right there. Those are big points. So we can shrink them down. We can say size equals like 0.5, alpha equals 0.5, make them transparent, make them small. Let's see what that looks like. And there it is. That looks a lot better. We can add theme void so we can get rid of the background here. Theme void, run that. So now it should just be the map of Georgia. Great. So those are all the schools. Um, 
We can add some additional information on here, though, because we're using the grammar of graphics. And so if we have a column in our Georgia Schools data set, we can map that onto something. Um, we have a column for total, I think. Um, I, yeah, capital total here for the total number of people in the schools. So we can actually color each of these points by total. So to do that, we can just come into our point layer here and say AES color equals total. And now it should use a gradient to color each of the points by how many students are in um, each of the schools. And this is kind of hard to see because this is just um, this isn't like a good um, perceptually uniform scale like we've been working with like um, Viridis. So if we say scalar or wow scale color Viridis continuous. Um, and then just add a plus sign here, then we should get a nice Viridis scale that is more perceptually uniform across all of the breaks. And we can see most schools are kind of in this blue area. There aren't any giant schools except right here, which is Gwinnett County. And those are our giant high schools that Gwinnett uses for some reason. And they get the, the bigger colors here with the green and the yellow here. So there's all of the, the schools in Georgia. We can do some other things to enhance this. Instead of coloring the counties by like using gray, we can fill them with white. And um, we can do other stuff to enhance this, change the fonts. But in general, like we have a data visualization of all of the schools in Georgia with additional information, like the, the total number of students in there. Um, and to do that, we really just had to layer three shape files on top of each other. And even though they use different coordinate reference systems, this is different from this one, and I think these two are the same. They came from the census, but this is a totally different one. It didn't matter because um, GMSF figures out how to get them all to match behind the scenes, and they matched. So there we go. A couple more points that we'll show really quick. Um, it is possible to map your own points or create your own geometry column. Um, so one thing that's disappointing often is when you load data from the internet or find the CSV file somewhere, or if you want to put a dot for Atlanta somewhere on a picture. For instance, let's take this map here that we've been working with. We have the Atlanta metropolitan area. So let's paste that in here. So this is the Georgia shape file for the state plus all of the counties just for Atlanta. Let's say we want to put a dot at where Atlanta is. Um, we can find those coordinates on Google Maps and then we can type them in um, and then we can map it and that's like totally possible. We don't need to go find a shapefile on the internet that just has one row in it for Atlanta. Um, we can make our own ge magic geometry column and work with that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So the easiest way to find latitude and longitude information is to go to Google Maps and then search for some place. So I'm going to search for the Atlanta here. Oh, let's bring it over here so you can see. Okay, so here's Atlanta in Google Maps. If we want to figure out what the what the coordinates are for any point in Atlanta, um, let's go ahead and do like the Andrew Young School because that's where you're all taking this class. There's GSU. So let's zoom in a little bit more. And there's five points. So the Andrew Young School should be right about here. So this is the Andrew Young School of Public Policy. Um, Georgia State right there. If I want the exact coordinates for that location, I can right click on the map and then choose what's here. And then down at the bottom, it will actually tell you the coordinates. This is 33.754, etc. And then negative 84.39, etc. So that is the coordinates for the Andrew Young School um, in the latitude longitude system. And so what we can do is copy and paste that into R, and then we can convert that into our magic geometry column. So let me go ahead and grab that because I don't want to type it. Okay, so here is Atlanta. Actually, it's a few different cities here. Um, so if you remember from a couple sessions ago, I introduced you to this triple function, which lets you make kind of your own little tiny data set within R. Another way to do this is you could open up Excel and make a small CSV file or Excel spreadsheet in there and type these numbers in there um, and then load the CSV file in here. But that's like a lot of extra work and using multiple programs. If we use this triple function, we can have kind of this column for city, this column for latitude, this column for longitude. And so 
we can plot all three of these cities um, because we can. Why not? So here's three different cities that we want to add to our Georgia map here. If we run this, what we will have is a small data set called Georgia Cities that has a city and it has latitude and has longitude. The problem with this, though, is that R has no idea that latitude and longitude are actually geographic information. It just thinks they're numbers. And you'll see this often in data sets. Um, in your first mini project where you had to work with the rats data, there were actually columns for the latitude and longitude of every rat sighting. Um, so you can technically map all of the rat sightings if you really want to. Um, the issue, though, is that it wasn't a shape file. And so R has no idea that that is geographic information. We have to somehow convert these two columns into that magic geometry column, um, either in this or in any situation where you have latitude and longitude as separate columns. Um, once we convert that into the magic geometry column, then we can add it as a geom SF layer and it will show up in our maps. So to do that, there is a function that comes with the SF package called ST as SF. And if the way this works is we have to feed it two arguments. We have to give it um, which of the coordinates are longitude and which of the coordinates are latitude. Um, so, and it's in that order for whatever reason. If you look in the help file, you can see it. So we're going to say the coordinates that we care about, um, the longitude is named long, and the latitude is named lat. It doesn't have to be that. You can name them whatever you want. It just has to match whatever is in the data set. And then the second thing we have to tell it is what coordinates refer coordinate reference system is this data using? So this, this 33, negative 84 stuff, this comes from Google Maps, which uses the negative 180 to 180 system, which is kind of the, the standard GPS system, um, which I have not memorized. I have done this many times, and I just copy and paste from other code. It is 4326. That is the coordinate, coordinate reference system that Google Maps uses. So that's all we're saying here is that these points right here come from 4326. Um, so if we run, or we have to tell it CRS equals 4326. So if we run this now, we will no longer have a column for city and then a column for latitude and a column for longitude. We will have only two columns, city and then the magic geometry column that has all of the embedded geographic information in there. And so now, if we come back up to our data here, let's move this plot down so it's in the right order here. So we're going to have the Atlantic counties, and then we're going to say geom underscore SF and say data equals GA cities. And if we run that, we will show Atlanta and Athens and Savannah right there on the map. You can see where downtown Atlanta is in reference to metropolitan Atlanta. And we've got it all labeled on there, or not labeled. We've got it all plotted on there. If you want it labeled and we want actual text on here saying this is Atlanta, this is Athens, this is Savannah, there's a function called geom underscore SF underscore either label or text. With label, you'll get a border around the text with a background. With text, you'll just get the actual words on the plot. And so if we say geom SF label, the data we want to label is GA underscore cities. And then we have to tell it what column to map onto the label. So we do this with AES and we say label equals, and then we go look at our data set and we say we want that city column to be labeled. So we say city. And if we plot it now, we should get the state shape, the county shapes, the point shapes, and the labels. Okay, one issue here is we no longer see the points. Um, that, that's because the labels are on top of the points. So there's an argument, just like we've been doing with other geom text functions, called nudge. And we can say move the y axis, move the y point up a little bit. And so we can, I never know like what scale this is on, and so I'll just plug in random numbers until it looks okay. So let's move it up by 0.5 and see if that does it. That might be too far. Um, so there's the point, there's Athens. So let's move it down to like 0.3 and see if that looks okay. And neat, that looks okay. So now we have our, our city labels with metropolitan Atlanta with all of Georgia in there. It does give you this warning here. Um, that is just technically when you're dealing with these map things, 
um, you're taking something from a globe and then flattening it. And so some of the different um, geoms, like geom label, it struggles sometimes with making it super accurate, um, transforming from this round thing to a flat thing. And so that's all it's saying here is that it's warning, that it might not be perfectly accurate. Um, most of the time it is going to be accurate because you're just plotting maps and it's fine. Um, so you can ignore that warning. Often I'll just come up here to the chunk options and say warnings equals false and messages equals false. So I don't see that. Um, but there we go. You can do your own arbitrary points. If you want to do like the, the rat data from mini project one, um, if you want to create your magic geometry column, you would just add this to um, the pipeline where you're filtering and mutating and stuff. This will make that magic geometry column and then you can plot it using GeomSF. And so you can plot every single rat sighting in New York over like five years or whatever it's in, whatever's in that data set. It's probably just going to be a massive blob of black because it's just going to be like 100,000 dots, but you can do it. Okay, the last thing I want to show that is also important, um, very important, especially because you rarely work with shape files. Um, so far in this class, this is the first time we've done anything with a shape file. Um, we've been working with regular CSV files. Um, one of the most common data sets we've been looking at is the gap miner data, um, which has life expectancy and GDP per capita in it. Um, we've also gotten data from the World Bank, their worldwide development indicators data, um, so that we can look at a whole bunch of other things like um, childhood education and um, literacy rates and other things. When you get data from the World Bank or from any other place, often you'll have state information or country information. You'll have a row for every country or you'll have a row for every state. Um, but there's no GPS information in there. There's no geography in there because it's just a regular data set. Um, so if you want to take something from the World Bank, for instance, or unemployment rates in the United States from the FRED data, um, none of that has geographic information. So what we need to do is combine that with a shape file and once we do that we can plot both at the same time um, which is generally what you do like most shape files only really come with like a geography column and some identifying information um, like the georgia schools data this is a common shape file one it's messy and i had the indonesian school but two all it really has is just identifying information for each of these um, schools they did throw in school population for fun. They didn't have to. Um, but then they have the geometry column. Um, with the world map data that we got from Natural Earth, this is special because it actually comes with a ton of extra columns. It has lots of identifying information. But we did see as we went down that it also included population. It didn't need to. That was just like a helpful color they threw or a helpful column that they threw in there just for fun. So that you can, if you want, you can fill by population and you have a population to column to work with. But often you're not gonna have one of these. What you need to do is find population or find GDP or find whatever value you care about from a different data set and then bring that into the shapefile data set and then you plot it. So to show how this works, we're going to come back to our, our markdown file. We have a lot of data sets open here. Let's close it. OK, so we're going to get some data from the World Bank, and then we're going to merge it into our world map data set and plot it. Um, so we're going to use the WDI library to access data directly from the World Bank's servers. And then we will grab life expectancy data, because why not? Um, only for 2015. So here's the code for it. I grabbed it from um, a file I have over on another screen here. So if we load the WDI library, we're only going to feed it one indicator. This is the life expectancy indicator that comes from the World Bank's data um, portal. You can find that in the URL. And so what we're going to do is grab, using this WDI function, we're going to grab all countries' life expectancies for 2015 to 2015. So it's just going to be that one year. So if we run this, it should go out to the World Bank and collect the data. And now we should have, if we look at WDI raw, we have our World Bank data, um, which has different ISO codes. So this is the two character ISO code. There's a three character ISO code. We have the year. This is our life expectancy column. We have other things in here, country name. Um, interestingly, they actually give us the longitude and latitude of each capital. So if we really wanted, we could use ST as SF to convert this into a geometry column, and then we can map all the world capitals because now we have the data for it. 
Um, so that's convenient, I guess. We're not going to do anything like that right now. Um, what we want from this data set is we care about this one column here. We care about life expectancy. And we want to somehow get this one column into this data set of the world map. And if we can somehow add that single column to here, then we can map the world map data set and fill by life expectancy. And then we can have each of the countries have a different color for each of their life expectancies. So the way we do this is we need to first have a clean version of our WDI data. Um, we technically don't have to. We can just bring all of the columns over. If we merge these two data sets right now, it will bring every single one of these columns into this world map data, which fine. But this data set already has like 95 variables. And so if we add another like 11 to it, then suddenly we're like 100 plus variables. And that is probably just excessive and too much information in one place because we don't need it all. So the best thing to do, what I always do, is I make a smaller version of the data set. So I'll call this one WDI clean. And we're just going to base this on WDI raw. And all we're going to do is choose two of the columns. We want the column for life expectancy, which is this cryptic code here. And we want this ISO 3 code so that we know which country has each life expectancy. So I'm going to come in here and say select. We're going to rename this cryptic code. And it's going to be life expectancy equals that thing. And then we want ISO 3C. So if I run this now, I should have a tiny data set that has a whole bunch of rows in it, but a column for life expectancy and a column for the ISO code. And the reason this is important is the way you merge two data sets together is it needs to know um, it needs to have a shared column, essentially. It needs to know that this 71 goes with Aruba, and this 71 or this 63 goes with Afghanistan, and this 78 goes with Albania, etc. It needs to know which column goes or which row goes with which row in each of the data sets. And if you have a column that matches, so here we have ISO 3C. If we come back to our world map data, one of these columns is called ISO 3. Um, sometimes it forgets to line up the columns. We can just close that and come back to WDI raw. And if we scroll over, no, not there, world map. If we come here, one of these columns is called ISO A3, which if we scroll over and over, eventually we will find it. Wait for it, there it is, ISO A3. So as long as we have two matching columns, when we tell these two data sets to merge, it will look for Fiji in this data set. It will look for Fiji in this data set. Um, in the smaller data set, this WDI clean, it will look for Fiji here, and then it will use the value for Fiji here and add it to the world map. Wow. So the way we do that is there's a function called left join, which lets you take one data set and stack it to the side of the other data set. So we're going to make a new data set here called um, world. We're going to base it not on world map. We already made one that had that didn't have um, Antarctica. What did we call that one? Let's go back up because we don't want to plot Antarctica. We called it map minus Antarctica. So that's the world map data that we want to use, and we want to merge in our life expectancy data. So we're going to call this map combined. Sure. Um, it's going to be based on map minus Antarctica. And what we're going to do is use the pipe and say left underscore join. And we're going to join the WDI clean column or data set to the map minus Antarctica data set. Right now, if we try this, it will actually yell at us because it says neither of these column, neither of these data sets have a column that has the same name. Um, the names are slightly off. This is ISO 3C, all lowercase. In this data set, it was ISO underscore A3, all uppercase. So we could either rename this column to be ISO underscore A3, all uppercase, and then they would match. Or we can actually manually specify which columns equal the same. And we do that with by. So we say by equals, and then we have to give it a list of two things. So in the first data set, it is called ISO underscore A3. 
And then the second data set, it is called ISO3C. If we do that, it didn't quite do it. That's interesting. I have a typo somewhere. Oh, it's because you don't do a comma here. You do an equal sign. We're saying this column in this data set is the same as that column in the WDI clean data set. So now if we run it, it should be it should have worked. If we look at map combined, we now have 96 columns instead of 95. And if we go to the very end of it, all the way back by the geography column, there is our life expectancy that we brought in from the WDI data. It knows where to match it because it's looking at wherever the ISO code is the same. So now we have a column in our world map data that we can use to plot life expectancy. So if we come down here and use ggplot, and we're going to add that map layer, so we're going to say geomsf, um, we called it, so data equals map combined. We're going to map something onto it. We're going to say aes fill equals life expectancy because now we have a column for life expectancy from the world bank expectancy and that's technically all we need for a basic map here there are all of the countries in the world filled by life expectancy um, we can make it slightly fancier again by using um, the Veritas scale we can change the the projection here this is kind of the standard gps style um, projection which distorts countries way up at the top here. So to do that, we can just add a couple more layers. We can say scale fill viridis continuous to get the viridis scale. Um, and then we can say chord underscore SF. And we'll use the Robinson projection, which I can never remember the number, but I look it up all the time. It is, Robinson is 54030. So now if we plot it, we should get a nice Virida scale plus um, the Robinson projection, and it's all working. The last thing I'm going to do is just get rid of the theme so that we don't have any of that gray stuff behind. And there is our world map of life expectancy around the world. Um, you can see where it's the highest. You can see where it's the lowest, and that's, like, really cool. Um, so that's a basic overview of how you work with these, these shapefile uh, objects. The main key to remember is that you have, if you load a shapefile, you'll have a magic geometry column. And as long as you have that geometry column, you can use geom SF and chord SF, and it will figure out the best way to map and it will transform between all of the different coordinate reference systems. You don't need to worry about that in general. Um, if you don't have a shapefile and you just have raw numbers like this, you can convert those into the shapefile column using this function here, and then you can plot whatever you want. Um, the example page for today has lots more examples and lots more annotated code explaining how to do all of this, so definitely check that out um, for more information. And good luck with your exercise, which is just making a map. So have fun.